Il ne m'a pas vu. Hi. So, I've spent the last year watching all of the feature films of director Celine Siama, and I thought it might be a good opportunity to circle back and do something I never do on this channel, which is rewatch a movie. Portrait of a Lady on Fire is a 2019 film by director Celine Siama. It's the first film of hers that I saw. I saw it back in and in the end of 2019, I actually had tickets to go see it on uh, Valentine's Day in 2020, but the tickets were to a theater in Williamsburg, and I'm just not going to do that. I had already seen the film at that point, and kind of had my moment with it, so I put it off and haven't watched it again until today, and I'd be happy to bring you guys along. This has been a whirlwind of a year going through Celine Siama's oeuvre. If you're watching this video, you probably already know my relationship with her and her work. Every single feature of hers has presented some new, challenging, and rewarding experience, and I want to see if we can see some continuous threads, see if there's anything new we might remark on on a repeat viewing. My intention going into this is to be as cold and dry and clinical as possible, to just weave a continuity, a through line, uh, through the director's work. And I will try my best not to be a blubbering mess. So yeah, let's watch Celine Siama's 2019 film, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, Portrait de Jeune Fille en Feu. Festival de Cannes, Festival de Cannes, winner of Best Screenplay. And beginning the film with a white canvas and already setting up a theme of woman as both the observer and as the subject. This uh, recurring theme in Siam's work of kind of duality, of playing multiple roles simultaneously. Naomi Merlan's character um, is the subject and the teacher simultaneously. La silhouette. And introducing the... Um, the, the motif of women's eyes observing. Le temps de me and I love how these instructions can be taken as instructions for in art and also in love. La de mes bras. This, this theme that I've taken from Siam's work of kind of a double speak of language having dual meaning if you kind of understand it's like queer coded language, if you can hear the secret language and the beautiful, beautiful costumes that she's introduced in this film. Beautiful, beautiful color palettes in this movie. I can't even believe, I can't believe how beautiful this movie is. Ay, uh... Portrait de la jeune fille en feu. Portrait de la jeune fille en feu. And I, I know it's got a bit of blowback these days, but in terms of the the Bechtel test of it all. This movie is kind of like a reverse Bechtel, where like no men speak over the course of the entire film, except for like this one exchange that one of the crewmen has with her a couple minutes from now. And always, 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 always water in Celine Siama's work. Here, reaching its fever pitch, with the entire groaning ocean. It's both oppressive. It like landlocks these women, kind of like they're landlocked in their roles in society, but it also offers seclusion, isolation for them, a secret split, uh, space to explore. Beautiful, beautiful colors, god damn it. You gotta give it to her new cinematographer. I think she's a woman too, I forgot her name. Yeah, Claire Maton. I remember the first time I watched this, like, how much of a different film I was anticipating this being. And so I went in under the assumption that this would be a, a kind of um, a supernatural manner piece, like a ghost story. And in a way it is, but I, I, I kind of took this to have a kind of a, a Rebecca tone to it. It's une salle de reception. Je l'ai toujours connu vite. Uh, kind of something in the vein of Daphne du Maurier. 
and it turned out to be something so, so incredibly different. The beautiful canvas is soaked. Oh my god. I love how tactile that is. Just the impression of her hand on it. The idea of this canvas being submerged, of it being saturated, is just so... It's so evocative. Right, right, her sister was supposed to marry and she's taking her place. That's why. And the suggestion that her sister has committed suicide is the, the, the phantom that hangs over this film. I don't know when, but I was developing this storyline in my head that that Mariam was actually a, kind of a, like a social climber. She was here to like steal her way into the family's value, valuables or riches. And perhaps even steal um, uh, Eloise's identity in society. Kind of like um, Tom Ripley. This also led me very, very much down the Daphne du Maurier storyline, because this uh, very much reminded me of um, her book and its adaptation, um, uh, My Cousin Rachel. My Cousin Rachel also deals with a character uh, where you question whether or not she has suicidal ideation. Yeah, and the idea of a woman's image being something that's affixed, something that's separate from her identity, but is an expectation that she has to meet. Uh, the idea of a portraiture being given to a man to see if he'll accept her in marriage, that a woman's identity becomes objectified and turned into a commodification, a commodity that's traded between men. I just love Celine Ciala's stuff, man. Just huge, huge vibes. Beautiful, beautiful muted color palette on their dresses, on her dress, because of its uh, uh, because of its linen textile in contrast with the the kind of silken dresses that the con uh the Comtesse and and Eloise wear. Uh, the the oil on the canvas, the sound of it, the 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 irregularity of the brushstrokes, so many beautiful textures, of things that light is bouncing off of in this film, hair, skin, linen, cotton, wood, oil, canvas. It's such a beautiful and tapestried film. Elle est là, elle vous attend pour sortir. I love, oh, I love when the, the cape falls down. Oh, beautiful. What a beautiful reveal. And I, I, the sounds of the ocean intensify only when she begins running. It was actually just like muted in the audio channel before then. Again, playing with your expectations. I have no idea where this takes place. That soft rack, that was nice, nice camera work. Good job. Good job, focus puller. Playing off the idea of observation constantly. Il faut le plus possible faire entrer l'eau. Son ton de chair, même dans la lumière, doit céder en général à la lumière de la joue. Vous êtes venu avec un livre? Oui. Jesus, Naomi Merlant's got huge eyes. It it came as a bit of a disappointment to learn that when Celine Siamo was casting Tomboy, she cast Zoe Aron not solely based on her acting qualities, but also on her physical qualities. She said specifically that she was looking for a certain kind of Phonoge photogenic quality in Eran for the role of of Mikhail. And to me, 
that's kind of a disappointment to hear. You you want to hear you want to think that uh, directors are looking for something that's performance based, that's chemical, that's alchemical. But I do have to conceive that sometimes Siyama finds just exactly the right look, and part of that look is the absolutely huge eyes of Na Naomi Melon. Oh, it takes place in Brittany. Okay. That's hilarious. She's drawing her smiling. Literally never seen a character smile in a Celine Siava film. <laughs> it's not true. They smile sometimes. No. That, that probably means no. Low-key, she's asking you to teach her how to swim. She's asking you to swim with her, girl. Oh, right. She's observing, like, her veins, hairs on her arms, hands notoriously difficult to draw. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Something you never think of in a Celine Siama film. Have you tried being funny? That might work. C'est ma sœur qui le brodait. Vous pensez qu'elle a voulu mourir? Vous êtes la première kind personne of a personal à avoir question. Poser cette question. Après vous, j'imagine. Is that her trying to be funny? D'autant que dans sa dernière lettre, elle s'excusait. De quoi s'excusait-elle d'après vous? De me laisser son destin? Oh, 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 oh no! <laughs> I don't know. It could be. You know, you're a closeted <laughs> gay person living in the 18th century. Maybe <laughs> being forced <laughs> into a marriage <laughs> might not be the greatest. Vous auriez préféré rester au couvent? C'est une existence qui a ses avantages. Vous pouvez chanter, nice. entendre de la musique. Ah, the music. That's uh, how they're going to relate to each other. Heureusement, je l'ai quitté après ma première communion. Je passais mon temps à me faire punir parce que je dessinais dans la marge de mes cahiers. Because she's been an artist her entire life. It's it's interesting to see them play out their tactics. Um, Quand allez-vous vous marier? Je ne sais to pas. To see si how Maryam tries to ingratiate herself with mm -hmm. Eloise, like yeah. saying that she uh, was in the convent too. If I wonder if that's like a secret kind of communication that she desired a similar kind of experience or lifestyle in the way of Eloise. Perhaps not expressing um, a queer desire, but expressing a, a an, an un, or, or unorthodox or outsider uh, desire. And also. In terms of like the secret language and stuff, them literally doing code switching, switching between languages in this conversation. It's slight, but there is that motif continuing. There's this difficult question of whether or not the mothers are kind of aware of the queerness or the... <sighs> this is actually where I thought there's a plan hatching in Eloise, uh, in in mariam's mind that she's going to take the identity of eloise that she's going to paint a portrait of herself and send it to her suitor in in milan and that's why she's trying to ingratiate herself to this family so that she can learn more about eloise's identity to eventually steal it turns out it was nothing like that but there's a a, a question of whether or not the mother is like aware of the queerness of of, of their daughter like uh whether or not uh, Mikhail's mother is aware of their transness, and in this, a question of whether or not Eloise's mother is aware of her sexuality. Je vais aller à la messe. Vous voulez communier? Je peux entendre de la musique. Racontez-moi. I, I don't know why, but I also like that the first time, um, Marianne is making progress with Eloise. She's changed her costume. She's disrobed to a de degree. Music is an absolutely integral part of Celia and Siama's films. And so it makes absolute sense that two characters would relate over music in one of her films, finally. Mm -hmm. 
Bum. Bum. This completely changed my mind on, on the four seasons. I had absolutely hated Vivaldi previous to this movie and only associated this piece with uh, Old Boy, and this completely turned me on 180. C'est vivant. C'est vivant. <laughs> and the description she gives of the imagery of this piece. Oh, coming storm. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> so evocative. And it's about the secret story in things, in art, in communication. And she's like creaky and unused to speaking this language, which is the language of seduction. Oh, and she ruins it by trying to transfer it over to talk about Milan. Oh, they got so close! Marianne, come on! Oh, God. I am Eloise. Just this fucking depressed girl. Jesus Christ. So you're saying sometimes it won't be the worst time in my life? I feel so bad. I'm like, I'm so much like Eloise. Ew. Oh, man. Oh, man. Eloise is... Fucking direct, man. She's got that Marie thing of saying what you want and trying to be as direct with somebody as possible. Yeah, what did this previous painter miss? Was he on the right track? What didn't he understand about his subject? Do you understand? Is there something about Eloise? that you're not seeing. She's lit her heart on fire. It's so powerful. I... There's just something in these characters' hearts that knows the answer, even if they don't. It's so beautiful to see human desire expressed in film. And just a small small design yeah. decision uh in terms of their hair and makeup i like that her hair is broken down over the course of these six days just slightly broken out of its rigidity and form Alors, que je me so you can feel the dam about to burst you don't know it but it's happening in your mind <laughs> their lives are so rigid and they they just yearn for like this kernel of freedom yeah it's terrible it's absolutely horrible about here i'm like giving up on the uh the the daphne de maurier plotline <laughs> get fucked get fucked get fucked, get fucked. <laughs> holy shit Oh my god, I have not seen a woman burn like that since... Yes, 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 yes. These ladies' gaydar is shocking. Shocking! They're not even dating and they're already fighting. So in this, they, they fight about art, but what they're really fighting about is their feelings towards each other. She knows. The mom knows. It's such a weird, charged relationship. The mother-daughter rel relationships in these movies. Que cela pour vous? Rien. It's such a weird relationship of miscommunication. I can't explain how economically Siyama, over the course of multiple films... Your mileage may vary how much you get out of each individual film, but this tapestry she creates over the course of many films of a gulf between a mother and a daughter. Un peu. And this is kind of mirroring in a weird way the relationship between Hanel and Siama, the 
uh, the subject being a performer and the painter being a director. Regardez-moi. Uh, gay panic, gay panic. Ça vous est arrivé? Vous avez connu l'amour? Ça va quoi? You fucking right. Oui. She's been Comment to Milan. Je veux dire qu'est-ce que ça fait? Tout le monde en ouais. She's always looking back at you. This is kind of, um, to a certain degree, also echoing uh, a future theme that this movie will develop the, of the story of Orpheus, that there's always a desire to observe and to see. And Marianne, as the painter, is somewhat obsessed with observation and neurotic about being observed and part of this kind of a uh, partnership that they develop this intimacy is her being okay with being observed you're getting closer <laughs> she's not smiling anymore that's a start Bene. remind me to make a note when they start using two with each other i love how deep Penel's voice is just just such a flex She's got a beautiful voice. Disgusting. Mouth breather. Caroline Davernus would like to have forward. They find such weird ways to flirt. Weird 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 ways to flirt. <laughs> it's not allowed. C'est une question de pudeur. Surtout une façon de nous empêcher de faire de la grande peinture. Speaking the truth. <laughs> Speaking the truth. Comment faites-vous? Je le fais en secret. A huge, huge idea or theme in Saline Siamas films is secrets. Um, the good, the bad, the all-encompassing, world, our worlds are created by secrets. Secrets that allow us to be who we are. So secrets allow us to confer with each other. Secrets are the black market by which people navigate and, um, and, and exchange their true identities in, a, in an oppressive world. I think I talked about this a little in my pillow book movie, but something that I really loved in that movie and that I had identified in this is the ways in which it views art as being not a singular form or singular medium, but it's actually interdisciplinary that art is a way of viewing the world and a way of expressing ourselves, and in that, so many things become art. Art is not just a portrait. Art is music. Art is is crochet, is stitch work. Art is myths and stories. It's it's whatever means by which we can express ourselves to each other. Frappant les cordes de sa lyre, il chanta ainsi Je vous en conjure, défaites la trame trop tôt terminée du destin de Ridis. And the viper kind of representing like um. A phallic or masculine symbol in this context. Taking, taking Eurydice's virginity. And so the story of Orpheus and Eurydice isn't just the story of um, going into hell and taking her, but also the story of reclaiming a love that's been soiled or that's been corrupted. That love surpasses. She does, because you do. Oh no, I hate that. Oh my god, the look on her face, because this movie is kind of like about how love is a language that speaks 
kind of um, asynchronously that uh, love is such a strong and a binding force that it, it kind of compels you to go through time in a metaphorical sense. And so when Eloise says she tells him to turn around, she's speaking to the future of their relationship and Marianne can see it because she has this kind of psychic knowledge of how their relationship will manifest, which is seen later when she sees uh, Marianne's ghost. God, I love this movie. Jesus Christ. I watch this clip over and over again all the time. And one thing I'll never get over is how one of these singers is just so excited for her cue to go. She keeps eye fucking this other singer. Like, this is, a, we're, we're about to go on. We're about to go on. Okay, we're going to do it. I'm eye fucking you so that we know we're going to do it. I can't even tell you how much was going on in that exchange between those two. I was actually under the impression this scene is going back in time, and it actually might be. Just that, like, their love story is something that's being told across, like, it mani manifesting itself outside of time. And things are kind of happening with time out of joint. So, arguably, this is, like, the second day that they already like knew each other and loved each other and had exchanged their first kiss but that can't be because they've been flirting around the top the issue this entire time and not been honest with each other and not been completely uh direct and so this has to have happened after the night in the of of the fire right but i don't think so i think their love story is something that's happening non-linearly they keep going into the past and into the future and their love for each other their passion uh kind of manifests itself in literal and met metaphorical ways is she gonna see the eloise ghost and yeah this is this is another instance in which time is breaking down when she went into the kitchen it was daytime outside and just in the t amount of time it takes her to go upstairs suddenly it's night the movie's actually quite playful with the theme of time with the idea of time it's just an incredibly incredibly dense and layered film and it's like weaves together love and romance and like gothic imagery and myth greek myth and portraiture and music into this deceptively straightforward but multi-layered piece that's what he says did she say soi or soi as soye? Ne bougez plus. She said soye. They do a little dominatrix thing. Okay, we're here for that. The French know what they like. And they like BDSM. I forgot about this scene. Oh, God. Tying in with the Greek thing. Um... I forget what this is called, but uh, they're engaging in um, what's it called? Like, <laughs> I forgot how uh, 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 moist this movie is. How how uh, is her eye color changed? Oh my god, this movie plays on so many weird themes, weird ideas of like transference. Of, like, identities blending and melding and disintegrating with the advent of love. It's like, oh my god, it's seriously two bodies becoming one. It's so lovely. This movie becomes so um, intoxicating as it progresses. Like, the lines just blur so much if you really are looking at them 
it's kind of like an impressionist painting where from far away the form is still kind of solid and you kind of understand what's going on but as you get closer and closer you actually see that things are like breaking down in really like scary and exciting ways I did it because I was proud. Je voudrais détruire aussi celui-ci. Pourquoi? So I can just keep painting you forever. Uh and it's and it's also like um Orpheus that um by fulfilling their duty, by like engaging in their love so thoroughly, they've actually kind of created their own undoing. Cause Orpheus, cause he loves Eurydice so much in one reading of it he can't bear to not turn around and in this the love is consummated by painting this painting and this painting is the way in which they'll be separated i'm always just shocked how siama manages to take really kind of older elemental stories and tell them in new and kind of like understandable ways without making it obvious like there are definitely directors who like I'm gonna do a new take on Shakespeare and stuff, uh, and you know you get Romeo plus Juliet, where it's very very obvious that it's an adaptation of that text, and that's fine. But in some ways, this is an adaptation of the story or the sentiment of Orpheus and Eurydice, and telling it in a kind of new and understandable way. I love Hanel's voice. It's just gotten so textured over this the course of this decade. <sighs> my, my my singular criticism is that they're, they're, they should have chosen their location days a little bit. Oops. They never. She never changes. They never change over to Twa. It's a volatile kind of romance. Quand sait-on que c'est fini? Un moment, on s'arrête. Yeah, that is like relationships. And also, kind of in tying in with the uh, water lilies idea, the idea of um, of kind of like play acting or fulfilling the role of the heteronormative, the the, the male counterpart. Um, she's been looking at. Eloise from the viewpoint of what would be appealing to her suitor uh, in Milan but in actuality she's looking at her from the vantage point of her own desire okay. I love how you can actually see the reflection move with with Hanel's own like breath Uh, I am subtweeting herself. <laughs> She's known the answer this entire time. And then the meaning of the phrase, had you known love, has changed. They've broken through from the initial meaning to the secret meaning underneath. History books will note that we were really great friends. <sighs> Moms be misunderstanding their daughters in these movies for real. I hate that she phrases it as a gift. It's awful. Awful. I kind of like that they've enlisted this like a uh, conspirator like to a certain degree they needed a, a witness otherwise it won't have been true relationships in a way are kind of a triangle turn around <laughs> the only time she says swa i'm sad you're allowed to be sad. I'm sad. The sea parting. 
On a tendance à le représenter avant qu'il ne se... Chez vous, on dirait qu'il se salue. And the white mirrors Eurydice. It's it mirrors her her wedding gown and also the specter of death. Je l'ai revu une dernière fois. Such an elegant way of expressing the absolute pain of never seeing someone ever again and never being seen by them again. <laughs> Man, remember when I said, I think it was in the <laughs> Girlhood video, um, remember when I said that Portrait of the Lady on Fire was one of the best movies I had seen in 2019, but it wasn't as good as uh, Shoplifters or Never Going Back? I'll still put it up there with Shoplifters. I think Shoplifters is really good. Uh... Uh, I'm gonna revise my decision on never going back. <laughs> uh, no, I couldn't have. Those are 2018, right? Yeah, that makes more sense. I was comparing them to Cold War. Okay, then that's fine. Uh, I don't think I would have ever said that Portrait of Leon Fire was not as good as never going back. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I think I was better equipped to handle this this time. <laughs> Yeah, uh, la jeune fille en feu par Jean-Baptiste de Lodi à Lobier. Céline Siama would like to thank Judith Nora and Laurent Siama. I just wanted to check one thing. Okay, that's not necessarily uh, indicating much. I was I was wondering if, um, for the final scene, if Eloise playing the part of an observer on a work of art of uh, uh, watching the performance of Vivaldi was actually mirroring the traits of Eloise but they're, they're such generalized kind of motions or uh, facial gestures that I don't think it's actually that, that remarkable um, I think I was better equipped to handle this this time uh, I had like a breakdown the first time I saw this and I still like appreciate this as much I, I think Rewatching it again after a year of watching Celia and Siyama films, I, I'm, I'm able to contextualize it better, and it doesn't seem like a massive, oppressive work of art. Uh, it seems like a, a continuum in a, in a continuum of uh, very different movies about different aspects of like um, this kind of Ur character's life, this kind of this life, this the, these slices, these. Uh, pictures in the life of a character as they kind of go through childhood into adulthood. This was a comparatively very, very adult kind of manifestation of ideas of love, of relationships, of communication in comparison to Water Lilies and Girlhood and Tomboy. And with that comes a sort of like recognition and one might even say resignation to accept one's lot in life and Yeah, overall feels like more mature and uh, in some ways like less painful. Not to say it isn't painful, it obviously is. It's enormously painful, but in a less anxious fashion, I'd say, than like definitely stuff like Water Lilies. Yeah, this is like fun. This is like more fun for me this time, kind of watching it as like a as a color in the spectrum in like the prism of Salian Siamba's body of work and I didn't have a breakdown watching it this time so that's great that's great um my big takeaways from Portrait of the Lady on Fire uh from the first time viewing it and this time I mean obviously Salian Siamba's amazing and her direction is impeccable and uh, I definitely came away from it the first time being like uh, I need to find out every everything I can about this director uh, my second takeaway was Adele Hadell's uh, she's just a shockingly great actress, and uh, her performance in this I would put up there with um, with the actress in Shoplifters the previous year as like truly 
Sakura Ando in the previous year, and uh, Ben Fo and and Ben Forster in uh, Leave No Trace the year before that as like these like genuinely some of the the great greatest performances I've seen in the century. Uh, it really really like honed in on Adele uh, Adele Hanel's performance the first time viewing this and definitely got a lot from it again uh this time around i think i uh focused more on merlot as a result and she was definitely bringing stuff too definitely definitely yeah this time i was for more focused on little detail stuff textural stuff lighting stuff uh i was kind of like overwhelmed the first time i watched this just like completely immersed in the experience and this time i got to take a little bit of a step back yeah it's a great film I don't. I. I don't have. I don't. Th I don't have anything really noteworthy to say about it. If you're watching this, you probably already know that. <laughs> um, yeah, I like. Don't want to watch Portrait of a Lady on Fire for like another ten years. I, I want to watch uh, a decade of Saline Siama films and then circle back around to this and see everything that's different, everything that's changed. It was beautiful to watch this after Water Lilies and see Hanel kind of transform over the course of almost uh, nearly a decade. She's done a lot of stuff, a lot, a lot of stuff in, in the interim. Um, she's, she's in a lot of movies, some of which I'll be checking out on this channel. But, you know, she's a French actress and so, I, and a non-English speaking actress. So, unfortunately, we, most of us will have never heard of her beyond one or two films. Uh... I, I just saw news that Naomi Merlant's gonna be uh, was cast alongside um, Nina Haas in a movie with Kate Blanchett. I forget who's directing it, but that's good. I think that's a little bit too much star power, but for me, Nina Haas is a standout in that. Kate Blanchett's fine. Naomi Merlant's fine. Nina Haas, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I don't know, I'm exhausted. I can't say anything about it. I, like... It's ineffable. You can't explain it. It's... It's... The whole movie is held in glances. The, the, the things communicated... Between those two at the bonfire... With... With Marianne seeing Eloise at the concert hall... I can't explain what all that is. I just know it when I see it. Yeah, go watch Portrait of a Lady on Fire again. Let me know what you think. And until next time, keep watching good movies.